Let me start off by saying um, I'm a historian at the Harvard Business School. Um, I teach a big course on the history of leadership, power and glory in turbulent times from Henry V to Steve Jobs. That means a couple of things. First, I get paid to read other people's mail, which is an interesting thing at the Harvard Business School. And no one goes to the Harvard Business School to take any history. So I came there when I was very young, straight out of a Harvard history department with a PhD in European history. And my work with the past, because I came of age in this pragmatic, right, can do, get it done kind of institution, has become, in the words of Mark Twain, history doesn't repeat itself precisely, but sometimes it does rhyme. So I teach history, I study history, I live in the past with an interest to in discovering and communicating and making come alive the rhymes with our moment, with you. That's the first thing. History, as I, have, as I own it, as I offer it, as I study it, is for curious right, tra travelers, human pilgrims today, trying to understand their world and how to live, if you will, in tune with their stronger self. So that's the first thing, and that's what I offer to my students. But the second interesting thing about teaching the history of leadership at the Harvard Business School is until we get to the very last few weeks of the class, we have no guests because they're all dead. Um, so, so these are stories I, I uncovered. They're not, you know, they're not, in, in most, in four, I'm going to tell you five stories. They're the stories of the life journeys of five ordinary people. With one exception, they all started from nothing, no cash, no connections. They were all incredibly self-educated. So one of the interesting lessons, the rhymes of these stories, and we're going to offer, I'm going to sprinkle my talk, like the book is sprinkled, the narratives are sprinkled with insights for our own turbulent moment. One of the really interesting lessons is how each of these people, I was trying to explain this to the students today, and then to the analysts, the, the, the career folks at lunch, is that the answers are not in our passive stroking of our lovers, our phones. Right? The answers are not here, right? The answers in great turbulence are not here. Right? The answers are actually here. Right? The answers are here, and it's looking broadly and pulling information. We're not accepting and receiving. We want to be pulling and then taking that information and translating it into knowledge, taking the knowledge, and dare I say it, translating that into wisdom. An age of this kind of turbulence, unprecedented turbulence, and historians are paid to study change. But at least two, two aspects of our, this VUCA, this volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, right? and the exhaustion right, of trying to live in this moment and take in all the firecrackers that are coming at us in terms of turbulence. I mean, I know it's been 10 months since the election, but honestly, it's at least 10 years. Right? Because so much is happening in so many se sectors all the time. And so much of it has so many high stakes related to it. Now, again, there have been other moments of great change. But in this moment, two things are unprecedented. Right? One is that we're now, I think, there's good evidence, whether we can document it perfectly, that we're running as a global village up against limits in terms of the Earth's production possibility frontier, in terms of the Earth's resources. That's unprecedented. There's nothing. We've got nothing to compare to about that. And the second really interesting aspect of all this turbulence is that there's always been you know, famines and coup d'etats and you know, wars and great churning of the landscape in different parts of the world. This is the first age when turbulence in one place quickly begets, almost immediately, turbulence across the globe. So turbulence now has its own contagion that's instantaneous, and that's new. Right? And, and that's new. So this talk, which was not, this book was 10 years in the making, 15 years in the making. It's a long pregnancy, a long, long, tortured pregnancy. And you know, I was on Charlie Rose the other night, which was very interesting. I've never done anything like, never met, I only met him once before. And boy, he's, he's good at what he does. And, and, and he said, wow, it took you a long time to finish this book. I guess that's, you know, in his aw shucks way. I guess that's because you're a busy lady. And I said, no. You're, you're gracious. Thank you, Charlie. That would be a good excuse. But I actually, in the middle of working on 
the first story here, which wasn't supposed to be part of a book, it was part of a business school case I was writing at Harvard on Ernest Shackleton. In the middle of that, my life started falling apart in big, hunky blocks. Big, hunky blocks, as Sylvia Plath once wrote. It was my, my father dropped dead one day after golf. My mother immediately fell apart. Uh, four months later, my husband, whom I loved more than anything in this world, walked out on me, said I was the problem in his life, and he needed to claim all the Harvard retirement money that we'd er I'd earned. I, yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the I, I, I immediately co came close to falling apart, lost 20 pounds in 20 days, didn't know how I was going to survive. My students were calling me. I was teaching HB, second year students, and the MBAs were all saying, look at Professor Kane, she's disappearing. Right? And before our very eyes, it was not a, it was not a good moment. Um, and then, not very long after that, I got diagnosed with precancerous symptoms four months later. And then the, about a year and a half later, I got cancer, no risk factors. And then I got cancer again. And then I lost all my money. And that was about a five-year stretch. So it took me a while to write the book because, <laughs> because I was... I was on my knees a lot of the time and just trying to get up and gather some mileage standing and walking. So it took me a while. Now, here's the second point related to the, to now we'll get to the substance, and, and turbulence. So I know a, a wee bit about turbulence. But in the middle of all this, early on, actually, right after Colin walked out, you know, you know it, all of you know, when you hit these, when you hit these, you know, these moments of great adversity, what's Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes say? Make no taste in time of adversity. And you're, you know, you're beset by the high winds, and the, and the big waves, and you don't sleep. One of the interesting things about crises is we don't sleep very well. So at 2 a.m., there were lots of waking up wide awake at 2 a.m. I can vacuum some more, but after a while, your house is pretty clean. <laughs> so I one day, I remember very clearly, it was a February night, I reached for Abraham Lincoln's writings. I didn't know anything about Lincoln. I was trained as a European historian. I didn't know anything about Lincoln. I mean, I'd read David Donald's still single best volume on Lincoln. And in 1995, and I, but I, I didn't know much about Lincoln. And I reached for it, I started with the, sec, the second inaugural, and I read kind of backwards into time. And it didn't take very long, a few nights when I was like, Miss Nancy, you think you got problems, girl. <laughs> this Mr. Lincoln, he had, it on, he had problems in spades. And that's where the book began. So the book began with my own crises and needing to understand how do leaders, and I'm not just talking about people with lots of authority, lots of titular authority. I'm talking about the leaders that we all are and that we want our kids to be no matter what we do. I'm talking about this definition of leadership. So I stumbled on this in the midst of all this long, complicated, winding road of a journey. David Foster Wallace, not, in 2008, writes a really interesting, very long-winded, it's David Foster Wallace, right? Sentences all need 100 words, brilliant, but 100 words essay on the first John McCain presidential campaign. And in it, there's, in, in, you can read the, the, the essay. It's called Up Simba. It's on the internet. In it, he riffs on leadership. And here's his definition that he gets to, and it's so spot on, I think. And this is, again, what brings me to the, the, the subject. Real leaders are individuals who help us overcome the limitations of our own weaknesses and laziness and selfishness and fears and get us to do harder, better things than we can get ourselves to do on our own. Leaders are individuals who help us, over, real leaders, overcome the limitations of our own weaknesses and selfishness and laziness and fears and get us to do harder, better things than we can get ourselves to do on our own. So I was interested, I realized I'm interested in how those kind of people, I want to be that kind of person, I've had some people like that in my life that did that for me. How do these people, how do leaders navigate from the inside out, from the inside out through great crisis, through great turbulence? And that became the question I was setting out to answer. There was a personal stake in it for me, although I didn't see it clearly at the time. But then as I'm writing and I'm discovering and bumping into interesting stories, the world is actually getting more turbulent. This was all before 2008. This book has a long, long life behind it. So the world just kind of syncs up with the question of how do we navigate? What do we learn? How do we navigate through crises? As individuals who want to be the kind of leaders we're talking about, whether we're fire chiefs or 
lawyers or school principals or activists or dare I say it, national politicians, because right now we're not seeing a huge number of shining lights of leaders of the kind Wallace is talking about. So the qu animating question in the book is how do we learn, now how do we navigate through crises, how do we, in those moments of great, potentially great doubt and great vulnerability, how do we make something better of ourselves that then has important impact in pushing the boulder of goodness forward. Because it turns out, I now can say this with great confidence, crisis is a really fine first-rate classroom. And any of you that have been, all of you have been through one. You know what I'm talking about. It's the potential in those moments to get bigger and stronger, even if you don't know how. Find some kind of diamond in the rough, make some kind of lemonade out of the lemons, or get defined by the crisis, get brittle. Get smaller, get angry, spend a lot, a lot of time on why. Two roads, and we all make a choice when we're in there to travel one road or the other out. So this book is about five people who found themselves in unexpected, life-defining crises. And in each case in this book, it turns out they had a number of them, and so the book reconstructs their emotional experience through that and how that emotional experience affected their impact in a worthy endeavor that literally pushed the, bo the boulder of goodness forward. So that's the agenda. And it's applicable to anybody trying to do anything decent today. And it's more applicable today than it was five years ago or than it was two years ago when I was desperate to publish the book. And for a lot of different reasons, the universe didn't want it out then. So here it is, right here, right now, just when it was meant to be. All right, so my agenda is to tell you a tiny bit about each of these stories, not to give the punchline away, because I want you to read it. I want you to read it. And you can pick any story. You don't have to start with the conclusion, the introduction. You don't have to read the conclusion, although I tie it up in the end. There's lots of overlap in the lessons. There's lots of connecting skeins. I'm going to talk about them at the end. But the stories themselves, which my, my wonderful editor at Scribner, Rick Horgan, said, make them really short, Nancy, because we're attention starved. We need to have read something quickly and check it off our list before we go to sleep. So there's short chapters, five stories. You can read them in any order you want. Um, but that's the agenda, OK? So let me tell you a little bit about each of these stories. And then we're going to talk a little about connect, uh, important lessons for today. And then we're going to open it up, OK? So let's start with Ernest Shackleton. How many of you have heard of him? OK, well, so there you go. So I won't, I'll, I'll make this even shorter than usual. So Shackleton, uh, but I want get to get to the lessons he learns, because you haven't heard of those. I know you haven't. So again, Shackleton, explorer, travels to the Antarctic four, four times in total. On his third trip, his ship gets stuck in, the, in pack ice. He's trying. He, like all of my other fabulous five, as Rick Corgan calls them. Each of these people starts their journey fueled by narcissistic gas. I'm going to do this. I'm going to be, the, I'm going to be a national politician, says Lincoln. I'm going to be the first to discover the South Pole. Rachel Carson, I'm going to be a best-selling author. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I'm going to be the most important wunderkind in Berlin in the 1930s. They're all fueled initially by narcissistic gas. And then interestingly, compellingly, as you heard from John Lewis not too long ago, that gas, that I, that narcissism, gives way, as Martin Buber has talked about, the philosopher, to thou. I becomes thou. The transition as they embrace a big, worthy cause and discover that serving others and being part of a big, worthy, collective good is really where the power is. So Shackleton starts out on another narcissistic quest in 1914 to be the first to walk across the pole. You all know his ship gets stuck right in the pack ice. It's stuck for a total of 11 months. But by seven months in, stuck and drifting in the South Atlantic, the ice starts to crush the ship. There's a lot of pictures in the book, so when you get to that part of the book, you can look at the pictures. The ice starts to crush the ship. The men have to abandon ship in September of 1915. In, in November, mid-November, the ship, in one day, goes down through the ice. I think I put, I didn't put a picture in there. It goes down through the ice in, in eight hours, and the ice closes over, and there's no line on the horizon. 
In Shackleton, here's where you, your, your, your knowledge ends, I, I, I believe. Shackleton paces, this is the point of the book, this is, the, this is forged in crisis, paces the ice that night. He, the men are all just desperate. They can't believe the ship's gone down. Shackleton is, is close to the chasm of doubt and despair. He writes in his diary, the endurance went down today. I cannot write about it. But he's pacing the ice, and later he says in his diary, a man must shape himself to a new mark the moment the old mark goes aground. So here's Shackleton trying to figure out how am I going to steal myself to do what I must do, to be who show up as I must show up in order to get these 27 men home to safety. So one of the really first interesting insights that Shackleton learns that's really important and very important for our age and, dare I say it, for our national politicians is that how leaders show up, what their presence is, how they hold their body, how they comport themselves, who they look, make eye contact with, when they say something, when they don't, turns out to have all kinds of important reverberations. So Shackleton, we know from his diaries, is doubt, doubts himself, doubts his ability to do, get these men home safe, safely constantly, and yet every day he walks out of his tent, right, shoulders back, confidence, exuding confidence. Lincoln does the same thing. Lincoln is, as you, many of you know, in moments massively depressed about the Union's possibilities in the, during the Civil War. And, 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 and very, very, at moments, close to despair. And yet, only a few people are allowed to see that, because if, the, if his soldiers see it, if his citizens see it, if Shackleton's men see it, the mission is lost. So would it, would it be, right, universe, that our national politicians would learn that how they show up and comport themselves in an age of global transparency and instant communication has gr great impact for good and great impact for degradation. And a very, what we're seeing right now, right, a very quick race to the bottom in terms of baseness on the part of how our leaders are showing up and how they're communicating. So one important lesson is how are we showing up? How are our kids learning they should show up? How are, how are all kinds of people where are all kinds of people taking their cues? So Shackleton learns that lesson. Second interesting lesson he learns. So the, 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 boat, the boat goes down in November. They're, they're on the ice floating with tents, with tents and canned goods and trying to kill enough seal, fresh meat to keep scurvy at bay for another five months. November, December, January, uh, February, March. And he has to somehow all that time, and even before, second lesson, important lesson for today, for you, the people that follow you, the, the, the people, young, younger people you're impacting, he has to learn to manage the energy of his team. We don't teach this at the Harvard Business School, but a huge amount of leadership, huge tool that leaders have. They can't often control what's happening from the outside in. They can have great impact around the people around them by helping manage the energy of a team, of a group of people, of a, just an impromptu coffee clatch. So Shackleton takes this charge very, very seriously. Why? Because the stakes are really high. If, 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 if ennui turns into doubt, if doubt turns into despair, if despair turns into discord, that's a very likely set of vectors of causation. He's, he can lose the whole game in his men peeling off and deserting. Right? He can have a Lord of the Flies moment. So another really important lesson in this chapter that's real, again, that's very, very relevant today is how are we managing energy around us? Right? Everything from you know, whether we're walking into a meeting room and putting our phone down on the, in the middle of the table, or whether we're furtively going like this. How are we managing the energy? So that's another important lesson that he learns. Last lesson, <clears throat> could not be more timely. So at the end of the book, I say that one of the most important connecting threads in these stories is that each of these people led from their humanity. You know, they led, Lincoln wrote letters to grieving daughters. If you, if you want to see one that no one's quoted today, that will, that, will, that will tear at your heartstrings and make you long for this, this kind of leadership, Google his letter. It's quoted in my book. Or just read the book. It's quoted in the book. It's a letter to a young girl from Bloomington, Illinois. That's where I grew up, by the way. My father, I was born in Chicago, then went to Champaign-Urbana for my young childhood, then went to my high school at BHS. Cubs fan. Um, 
and, and, and she was from Bloomington, Illinois. Her father had been a friend of Lincoln's when he was on the Eighth Circuit, riding the legal circuit. And his, her, he had died at Ball's Bluff. And he writes this three paragraph letter about grief and how it comes on the young unawares and what it means to people that are older and how you get through it. It's an extraordinary letter. So there's an example of leading from your sensitivity and your empathy. Here's the Shackleton example that's really unforgettable. Shackleton was very maternal with food. He used food as a leadership tool. He, you know, he uses it all the time to raise men's spirits, to show affection in an in a acceptable way in the military, in the naval, if you will, you know, a very male-dominated world in which he lived. But here's a really interesting, even better example. And I always say to executives who I coach, I say, women have been using leadership, food as a leadership tool for years, centuries. And the men all look like, leadership tool, food? Anyway, you know, hush a crying baby. You know, sue the cranky partner, offer your love to friends. Anyway, here's a great example of Shackleton and his humanity. So he makes this treacherous boat journey that I'll say two sentences about in a second, going from uh, the coast of western Antarctica, from Elephant Island to South Georgia in 1916. When he notices a man flagging, there are six of them, he orders up hot milk immediately for everybody. Hot milk to raise the energy level of the man who's flagging, but hot milk for everyone so that the man who's flagging never knows that Shackleton's pointed him out and is embarrassed. So this, you know, the man feeding and watering your people is another really, leading from your humanity is another really important lesson. All right, last, last couple of slides here. So as you know, there's this tremendous, amazing boat journey that Shackleton makes in this 24-foot lifeboat named the James Caird through waters that only one set of people in all the efforts, hundreds of efforts to recreate this boat journey, only one ever did. In 2014, a guy named Tim Jarvis recreated the boat, the food, the clothing, almost died twice, but he and five men did it. If you're interested in this, if you're a Shackleton fan, his book is called Chasing Shackleton. They, get, they eventually get to civilization, and then it takes Shackleton. This is May. A end of April 1916, it takes Shackleton five months to get a boat four times. It's like trying to convert to Judaism, only a little harder, right? <laughs> takes it four times to get a boat, four boats, three boats get repulsed by pack ice. Can't get to his men. He gets within two miles of them and he can see the outlines of the island and then pack ice forces him back. In August of 1916, August 30th, he finally rescues the other 26 men, that's the little Chilean boat, the tugboat Yelko, and those are the last of the men taken with a brownie camera by Frank Hurley, the photographer, sailing out, just about the last of the men, sailing back to civilization. As you know, they went back to the world at war. His world of heroic exploration had ended. Shackleton and his men all enlist. Two of them are tragically then killed in the fields of Flanders. And four years, three years later, Shackleton decides it was such a jolly good time doing it this last time, we'll go again. He's going again. He, on a ship called the Quest, he puts the call out to the crew of the Endurance, this expedition. And 12 of the, of the 24, 26, 24 living men meet the call and come join him. And they all said, we did it because the boss called. And then his story fades away. He dies, by the way at South Georgia, the, the whaling station where they had, he'd found help. Um, he dies of a massive heart attack in 1921 in January and is buried there. And his story just fades away until about 20 years ago when it starts surfacing again as something that's interesting to our times. So there's that shackled and there's much more in the chapter about him and his moments of doubt. But let me say a few things new about Lincoln because he's the most studied of the book. And I set out to write a book about Lincoln and then about five years in, in a wonderful rush of humility, I realized the world did not need another book about Lincoln. So this is a chapter about Lincoln. But I love him. I, I always call him Mr. Lincoln. I feel like I know him quite well. Um, and this is my favorite picture of him. So this is just really up here to show you that he could be handsome, that, that he was always disheveled. That is not Bumble and Bumble gel making his hair look like that. That is just that he was disheveled. And he was easily distracted. This is called the Danville portrait. It was, it was taken in the mid-1840s. Let me, I don't want to say a huge amount about the outlines of his life, because you all know them. Let me t t suggest a few things that I think are new about, my, about what I've discovered about Mr. Lincoln. Um, and I've done my homework. And it's, 
I, I could spend the rest of my life doing more homework, but I, I'm, I feel very confident of this. So a couple of things that are new about Mr. Lincoln in this chapter. This is not a book about Lincoln as commander and chief leader. It is not a book about Lincoln, the great abolitionist leader. It is not a book about Lincoln, the brilliant politician leader. It is not a book about Lincoln, right, the, the iconic leader for all times, one man great enough. It is, it is not that book. It is not that interpretation. It is a book about a man who had mostly failed, failed more than he had succeeded when he got to the White House, who was powered to the White House by narcissistic ambition and not great moral, a great moral compass, who became at the eye of, a per, of the perfect storm in four years, who grew in to the kind of president that we admire with great justification and that we long for in our own turbulent moment. And the ways I think, and that, that's not, there's nothing new about saying that. What's new about what I have to say is that because of his mileage with not only depression, that's been written about, right, but with, with failure and with how he navigated through failure, he was able to make the kind of transformation of himself and the country that simply wouldn't have been possible if he didn't have the mileage. So the first new point, and that Lincoln's experience as president is, is, is intimately detailed here's emotional experience um, that's the first thing it, but Lincoln could grow as he did and could and could make this huge defining decision around the emancipation proclamation and then because he'd made it lesson number three from Lincoln because he'd made it with a slowness of pace with great deliberation right with detachment I talk about Lincoln as someone who walked around the statue of an issue, like almost like you're walking around the David in the academia in Florence. He walked around big issues and looked at them, including himself in them, and looked at them from all angles before he made a decision. With anything that mattered, he, he slowed the pace down. Lesson number three, slow the pace, make no haste in times of calamity, says the Old Testament. Right? He slowed the pace, he detached himself to look around it, and once he made that, get, that astoundingly important decision to issue the emancipation, because he'd made the decision so deliberately, so carefully, what today we would say so tediously, so sluggishly, those are the wrong words, we're thinking about pace and decision making in the wrong way right now, because he'd made the decision so carefully, he could hold the line on it. And when you get to the last few pages of the chapter, and it's August of 1864, and, he's, and McClellan is about to become president and sue for a negotiated peace that keeps slavery intact, you will understand what Lincoln's ability to make a decision with that kind of deliberation meant and when he holds the line against huge obstacles. So the third lesson is about detachment and slowness and deliberation and reflection. So the so first way the book is new is all that mileage with failure helped him through all the great moments of doubt and despair and extraordinary adversity that he faced as president and the Union Army faced off and on all the way, almost, almost to the end of 1864. It's, it's, it's Sherman in Atlanta and then Sherman in, in Savannah that really defines the end of the war finally. Till then, the pendulum's just swinging back and forth and the future of the country's swinging right with it. Second new thing about Lincoln. This, is a, this, this frame on Lincoln is that one of his greatest gifts to the country was about his ability to take the country as it's transforming in the midst of the bloodiest war this nation has ever seen by orders of magnitude and communicate that change to the people, my fellow citizens to frame the stakes of the moment, to frame the stakes of the change, to frame the stakes of the turbulence. Think about the Gettysburg Address. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth, here's where we came from, here's what the prom, founding promise was, dedicated to the proposition that all men were created equal. Now, here's where we are. We are now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived, right down to the moment, here's where we are in the turbulence. We are come to dedicate a portion of that field. We are here in that battlefield of that war. We're dedicated. Here's where we stand right here today. Now, what's at stake, right? We've not come here to, hallow, to dedicate or consecrate or hallow the brave men living and dead. We have come, right, 
to commit ourselves to the great task remaining before us. That in this moment of turbulence and in this moment of transformation, all those dead will not have died in vain, and we will dedicate ourselves, right, under God to, to, the, to, to what really matters in the change, a change that costs great, great, has great costs and lives lost, Right, to the change that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. So the second thing I'm arguing is that the more turbulent and volatile the situation becomes, the more the leader in whatever walk of life needs to frame the stakes of the change for us in order not only to help us understand what's happening, but to understand what our role is and how we navigate through it to something better. So that's something we really need right now. We're not meant to be passive actors here, waiting for the new Damascus to come to Pennsylvania Avenue. So th that's another important, and this last piece about Abraham Lincoln that's new is that I think he comes alive as a human being. He loved animals. He loved black coffee. He was a total rancator. He sang body, dirty Scottish ballads to, to pass the long hours between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m., walk the White House, uh, halls a long, long nightshirt and spindly white, yellow, kind of whitish yellow legs sticking way down behind him, right, right down below him. So you'll get to know Lincoln if you read the chapter, because he's really interesting. And he's utterly, utterly human, so much more like any of us than the man in the marble in, in Daniel Chester French's memorial. That's Gettysburg. 50,000 people were killed or wounded in three days of fighting. Last point I want to say, here's the arithmetic of the, shock and awe of the arithmetic of the Civil War. 1.1 um, million killed or wounded. A lot of the, the deaths, as you know, were disease. That's 3% of the population. That'd be 9 million people a day, just to put it in perspective. Um, I want to offer one other lesson from Lincoln. So, and it's a lesson that all the leaders learn, but it's particularly obvious with Lincoln. Lincoln discovers pretty early on in his presidency that when the stakes are really high and he is really emotionally wrought up, the most powerful something that he can do as a leader is to do absolutely nothing. To not react in the heat of the moment. So there's an amazing letter he writes to George Meade, who's the commanding general, Union general at Gettysburg, after the battle ends. You will know, all remember that Meade defeats Lee there and Lee's army limps home to Virginia on, on July 3rd. And Lee, and, and Lincoln, and Meade decides, I'm not going to attack Lee as, the, as his, his, you know, his wounded army leaves because my soldiers are just as, almost as tired. And we're, we've lost a lot of men. And Lincoln gets wind of that by telegraph two days later that Meade's decided not to try and crush Lee a, a, on his way home. And Lincoln is furious. He can hardly contain himself. You can read the letter if you want. You can Google it. It's in the Library of Congress. It will pop right up on your browser. Lincoln to me, July 1863. And he gets going, three pages, neat handwriting. And he gets going by the second page after the gracious introduction. He's going. He's like, you have no idea how you have distressed me, General Meade. You have now prolonged the war indefinitely. Countless men will die. I am distressed beyond measure. And then he full, I picture him in his office, taking a second thought, looking again at the letter and what the consequences are. Folding it up, he puts it in an envelope. He writes to General George Meade, never signed, never sent. It's found in his desk after he dies. And so I often say to executives, what if Lincoln had had email and just hit send? <laughs> like we all do. And the reason I say this is because well, the reason Lincoln didn't send it is because he couldn't, at that moment, mid-1863, alienate another Union general. He just, he just promoted Lee two weeks, I mean, Meade two weeks earlier. He'd been through McClellan in, McClellan out. Or he'd been through Halleck. He'd been through eight, gen eight or nine generals. The West Point brass thought this guy was a micromanaging buffoon from Illinois. He had no more generals in reserve. Grant and Sherman hadn't yet made themselves known. This is before Vicksburg. Vicksburg is happening as Lincoln's writing this letter. So the higher the stakes, the more dis emotional forbearance and discipline we need. All of us right here, right now, would our president and politicians had one eighth of Lincoln's forbearance, so I didn't hit tweet, post, or send on important, on important endeavors, important communications that ultimately have done far more damage than good to any worthy mission. So that's what I want to say about Lincoln, okay? Um, he ta he's taught me a great deal. 
he, this is he when he got the nomination in 1860, Republican nomination. This is he right after the Gettysburg Address, and this is he um, right before he was assassinated. So he lost about 30 pounds over the course of war. He was 155 pounds when he when he was shot at 6'4". So um, it was good that he was physically so strong. His frontier experience mattered a great deal of the presidency. Let me say a few words about Frederick Douglass, OK? Um, this is a famous picture. I introduced this picture now. I, I chose it for the first slide of the Frederick Douglass um, story. It's an it's a, a escaped slave named Peter Gordon, who in 1863 escaped into Union lines in Louisiana. And a Union photographer was there, and they saw his back, and they took pictures of it and made it go viral. And so it became a hugely important anti-slavery image. And the reason I put it up today and I say to people is, there's, there's a whole lot of the past, right? What did Faulkner say? The past is not dead, is not even past. We're still living with, with Peter Gordon's back, our country. And Frederick Douglass, as many of you know, um, was born a slave 18, probably in 1818, since it was, slaves weren't legally considered human beings. His birth was not recorded in Talbot County, Maryland. And, escape, and, and, be, and becomes this extraordinarily curious, intelligent young man who teaches himself to read, because as many of you know, it was illegal in many states to teach slaves to read. Didn't want them getting ideas beyond their role as chattel. And he teaches himself to read by trading bread, bribing white boys in the streets of Baltimore. He's basically a house boy to his white, over, or his white master. Uh, uh, trading bread for the alphabet. And he learns to read and he learns to write in exactly the same way, this kind of entrepreneurial exchange. Teaches himself to speak by getting his hands on a copy of a book called The Columbian Orator. So he's reading Washington speeches to, you know, at the Battle of, um, at the, the Yorktown, Battle of Yorktown. He's reading uh, speeches from the great uh, Roman Senate. And he teaches himself to speak. And he goes, and, 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 and then in, in, his 19, in 1938, when he's 20, he escapes. And we, I detail all this in the book uh, in terms of the, his own fear, his own reluctance, his own anxiety. And there's one, there's one really interesting lesson early in his life. So let me offer that here. It really speaks to young people. Millennials really grab onto this. So let me offer it here because it's interesting that this is so powerful for them. There's a moment when he is sent at age 16 to be broken. Slave breakers were men, mostly men, who took slaves that were, you know, that, that didn't show enough respect and docility to their owners and for a fee tried to break them physically and psychologically, sometimes but with sexual abuse, but mostly with what we say we call physical abuse. Um, and, and so he's sent to a slave breaker named, named Edward Covey that lives not far away. And Covey just beats him every week mercilessly. And Douglas details how his spirit was broken and he became much more accepting of his position as a slave and he didn't want to escape anymore. And one day, Covey is ready to just beat the crap out of him. And Douglas decides in the moment, never planned, that instead of trying to run away, which he had done once before from Covey, he'll actually take Covey on. And they wrestle in this barn for two hours. And it's a draw. Neither man can really kind of throw the other for a long time. And, but a draw for Frederick Douglass is a victory in this context. And, and, and he steps away, and Covey steps away. And later, Frederick Douglass said, that was one of the most defining moments of my life. By the way, Covey never touched him again. He was there for four more months. Covey never laid a hand on him again. And he writes in his autobiography, that was a defining moment for me, for I faced my fear, I stepped into it, and now you have seen how a man was made a slave See how a slave is made a man. So one of the interesting lessons from Frederick Douglass is how it's incredibly important that we take a step, one small baby step, into our fear. And millennials find this incredibly interesting and powerful. And Douglass is a great example of it. So he escapes from slavery. That's two years later. He escapes from slavery, joins the white abolitionist movement with William Lloyd Garrison and Wendell Phillips and some other folks that are involved, William Seward, um, this is a slave auction in, outside of Baltimore, euphemized picture. This is he in his, in his, early, 19, in his early 30s, so uh, 10 years after he's joined the abolitionist movement. He does this, and he's very successful on the speaker circuit, extremely successful. After a time, he's so successful that people say he's a fake. He wasn't really a slave. He can never have been, right? He can never have educated himself. And so he writes his autobiography in 1845, the first of three, to prove them wrong. 
and he immediately is in danger because now his owner and master know where he is. And so his friends spirit him off to England, where he's going to be safe, he can work with the British abolitionists who are very active in trying to end American slavery, or as Marlon Brando says in the first reel of The Godfather, let's get Michael off to Sicily till things cool down, right? So he goes to, and he loves England, and he's feted, and he's, he mingles with all kinds of very powerful people. They, they, they desperately want him to stay. The abolitionists, they're white women, think he's just amazing, and he's, you know, women are throwing him some. He's happily married to a freed black woman. He has three kids back in New Bedford, Massachusetts. And he makes this really interesting decision in 1847 to come back. He's not yet freed. He will, people will buy his freedom for him. Patrons will buy his freedom. But he comes back because he says, I've got to be in the thick of it. I can't really make the difference I need to make if I'm not in the thick of the struggle to end slavery. And he spends from 47 all the way, all those 13 long years, trying a variety of tactics from moral suasion to insurrection to end, the, to end slavery. And does some of the most astute and important writings on race and slavery that this country, has ever, the world, has ever seen. So we need to rediscover Frederick Douglass right now and his great thoughtfulness about, about slavery and about the position of all kinds of people, because he's also lobbying for women's rights and civil liberties for women at the same time. His views on equality, they are so relevant today. Um, last point. So Douglass is a really interesting study, le fifth lesson or whatever, second lesson from Douglass, really interesting study in how as Peter Gomes once said, a minister who saved me when I was at my worst point, how you keep on keeping on. Because let me tell you, there are so many points in those 13 years when it doesn't look like he's going to, there's going to ever, he's ever going to be able to break the, 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 the shackles of slavery. And how he keeps, in his greatest moments of doubt, wanting to give up, how he, he keeps from climb, falling over the canyon to saying, I can't do this, I'm done. Is, is literally a playbook for our kids today, for the importance of resilience and dedication and hewing to a mission and climbing away baby step by baby step from that chasm. So he, it's quite astounding. Here's the, here's the last thing to say that's new about Frederick Douglass, and it's related to Lincoln. And that is that all the work that Douglass did, not just with the ordinary citizens, not just give, at meeting, abolition meetings in bars and taverns and hotels and barns, not just all his milling with people like Charles Sumner, the senator from Massachusetts, all, all his work with journalists, all that work, all those years, seeded the ground. And by the time we got to 1862, white northerners, and of course uh, uh, African Americans all over the country, had, had, a, had a much different view on slavery. White northerners had a very different view than five or seven or eight years earlier. And I argue with great conviction that Lincoln could never have had the political capital he needed to issue the Emancipation Pro uh, Proclamation and change the country and the stakes of the war without all the seeding, extraordinarily important work that Douglass had had. So they are bookends, one abs each absolutely essential to the other in the transformation of America. So that's Douglass. Let's do story number four, story we don't know about. This is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. How many of you have heard, oh, I'm sorry, that's Frederick Douglass, one more Frederick Douglass, right? Angry, right? M muscles of moral courage. He died of a heart attack when he was in his 80s, married to a, his second wife, a, a white suffragette, and they had just literally that afternoon returned from a women's rights, suff a women's um, suffrage convention. So he went down right, the, way he came, the way he came into the world, agitating, 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 for goodness. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, how many of you have heard of Dietrich Bonhoeffer? Oh, God bless you. That's more hands than ever have gone up before. So Bonhoeffer, who has a number of really important lessons for a, a world that's been strangely and frighteningly infatuated with authoritarian thinking and governance for the last five or seven years. Dietrich Bonhoeffer came of age in Berlin in the 1930s, and he began, he had just been ordained when the Nazis took power. His parents were very well connected. His brother worked in the Nazi government as a double agent from the get-go in the Department of Justice, compiling a list of Nazi atrocities. First concentration camps were built in 33, in case you didn't know that. This story begins very, very early, and it's very ugly from the get-go. 
And he begins, so he knows once Hitler comes to power, they know what's up, they know what, they, they can see a lot of what's going to happen. War, persecution of the Jews. Uh, he is writing, Bonhoeffer's writing in May of 1933 about what are the duties of the Christian church to protect the enemies of the state, including Jews. And, and as soon as one of the first things that Hitler does to consolidate his power in 1933, the Nazis do, is to take over all kinds of institutions, the press, the post, privacy, all kinds of things, including one of the most powerful institutions in Germany, which is the German Lutheran Church. This is Hitler with Ludwig Müller, who was the, his friend and appointed patsy to run the German Lutheran Church, which became called the Reichskirche, the state church. They promptly went about controlling the litur liturgy, trying to excise the Old Testament from the Bible because it was Jewish. And Bonhoeffer and a set of other very concerned pastors form an alternative church called the Confessing Church in 19, late 1934 and, and, and vow to fight Hitler on, on all kinds of grounds with theological weapons, including ecumenical weapons trying to unite European churches against the Nazi threat. And he does that in 34, 35, 36, 37, 38. And as he does it, he becomes an increasingly important person on the Gestapo and the military uh, 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 security service watch list. So gradually, and then in, with increasing tempo, his rights, Bonhoeffer's rights, and freedom of movement are restricted. He's fired from the University of Berlin, where he's a professor. He's, the confessing church is, is, is made illegal. Right? He's put, he's, he's, not, he's pro, 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 prohibited from any public speaking. He, they, they, he is always in danger of arrest, as are many of his colleagues. He can't, he can't, he basically, he can't do very much. And when, when war gets close in 1939, his friends, just like D Frederick Douglass's friends, say, we got to get Dietrich away because he's going to get arrested and possibly far worse. And they send him, let's take a look at him. I'm sorry we haven't seen him. I'm getting going here and I'm forgetting about my pictures. This is Bonhoeffer on the boat, headed for New York, from Berlin in July of 1939. We'll send him to the Union Theological Seminary. He can do a year. We'll wait till things cool off. He'll be safe. He gets there. He can't, within a day, the chapter opens. Each of these chapters open with these folks just losing, losing it in a crisis. He get, and this is where this chapter opens. He's, it's July 39. He can't, he can't stand that he's in German, he's in the United States when, when, when war is coming and he, he's got to get back and fight Hitler with his brethren. And he spends 10 days pacing and smoking and going to the World's Fair in Brooklyn and absolutely beside himself. And 10 days later, he gets on a boat and goes back to Berlin. His friends are all up in arms, like they can't believe he came back. And he has decided, and this is, the, he has decided when he comes back that, he's go, that he has to take a much more dramatic form of resistance. And he joins his brother-in-law, a gentleman named Hans von Doniani, about which we need a really good biography. His son is a very famous conductor, for those of you that love classical music, Christoph von Doniani. And his, he joins his brother-in-law, and later a brother, and another brother-in-law, all of whom are working within the Nazi government as conspirators to assassinate Hitler and try and end the Third Reich. So the second half of the chapter is a spy story. And if any of these books, these chapters get optioned as film rights, this will be the Hollywood one because it is such an unbelievable spy story. And how he and his family, right, the, way, the things they do, how they work out, what will happen if they get caught, and what they're trying to do. And most interestingly, folks, this is a man who's a pacifist. I mean, he, he, got, he came to his deepest spiritual and intellectual, if you will, kind of pinnacle with the Sermon on the Mount. And how he refuses to ignore the extraordinary moral consequences of taking the life of even such a terrible leader as Adolf Hitler, refuses to ignore them and grapples with that, as well as this tightening noose of raw evil, is something not to be forgotten and really to be read in our moment right now, as well as the broader story of how Hitler came to power and moved this country and the world to such an extraordinary place. So, so this is a really interesting story. In April, we're told, I'm almost finished here. I'm not going to tell you what happens because I want you to read the chapter. In April 1943, he and his brother-in-law are arrested and he is placed 
and an eight by ten. This is Bonhoeffer in, eight, in, in May of 1840 of 1943 in the, in the courtyard of Tegel Prison, and he he is placed in this eight by ten cell. And the last third of the chapter, the last fourth of the chapter, is his life inside this cell and what and the extraordinary impact that he has in this cell. I'm not going to tell you much more than that. So what do you do? How do you lead? Who do you become when all, virtually all, of your external agency is stripped away? And you're being interrogated every other day. And you're trying to keep your story straight with your brother-in-law through past coded messages because you don't want your family or anyone else to get caught in the noose. It's an amazing story. Lesson, the, there are many lessons from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. But the most interesting one to me is, is, a, is a version of what Mohandas Gandhi once said, my life is my message. Living thoughtfully, living decently, accessing your strongest self as much as you can is a powerful act of leadership unto itself. Okay, let me say a little bit about the last story and then we can open it up. This is the person that I'm closest to in the book, although I, know, I don't know her as well as Mr. Lincoln. But this is Rachel Carson. And, this, and she, like many of the people in the book, looks like who she is. I chose this picture very carefully for the first picture. This is who she is. She was born into a very poor, a poor family outside of Pittsburgh in 1907. She early on displays a literary gift. She was, her mother was a naturalist who homeschooled her kids in nature. Not homeschooled them, but taught them a lot about nature. And she is a very, very good student. And she's publishing stories in St. Nicholas. Does anyone remember St. Nicholas? I remember St. Nicholas. Publishing stories in St. Nicholas, the child's literary magazine, at a young age. She gets a scholarship to Chatham College, then called Pennsylvania College for Women, in Pittsburgh, and goes there, attends, and, and is a stellar student. Midway through her college years, she, she finds herself torn between her gift for writing and English literature and her discovery of the magic of the scientific world, of the natural world through biology and zoology. Not so much chemistry, but biology and zoology. And after a lot of kind of internal grappling, she decides to major in biology. She wins a scholarship to Johns Hopkins. And remember, folks, it's 1927, 1928. Women didn't go to college. They didn't graduate to col from college as they did. And they certainly didn't become scientists. And she becomes a scientist. She enters the PhD program. In, at, in, in Johns Hopkins on scholarship, and then her birth family, which had never really been too able to support themselves, collapses economically, and she brings them all, her father, her mother, her, her sister, who's split from her husband and her sister's two kids, and her brother to Baltimore, and supports them while she's, being, while she's working as a lab assistant and a teaching assistant trying to do her PhD work. So the story of her 20s is this astoundingly female story of trying to piece it together for her family, provide for her family, come home after class and teaching and lab, put dinner on the table, and then somehow figure out late at night what to write a dissertation topic about. Like every woman who begins work at 11 o'clock after they put the last load of laundry in the washer. Right? She's working all the time, like every woman. And, 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 and then, about after she gets her master's, a year into the PhD program, the family is so poor, she, can raise, she can't make enough money, and her brother and sister can't find jobs in the early years of the Great Depression, that she drops out of the graduate program and turns to full-time work. And she ends up working for the Fish and Wildlife Service, a series of different kind of twists and turns, as, as what today we call director of content, taking all kinds of fish and wildlife enterprises or initiatives or fields of study and making them accessible without dumbing down the science to a broad audience. And she turns out to have an extraordinary gift for this, because she's a poet. She's one of the most graceful writers you will ever read. If any of you remember The Sea Around Us, I remember that book. My mother read it to me when I was like six. Right? That was a book she wrote in the early 50s. She's an extraordinary gift for the, both the magic and the complexity of science, and then translating it without disturbing its integrity for a popular audience. And that's what she does through the late 30s, early 40s, publishes a book in 1941, a week before Pearl Harbor, so it gets no attention. She wants to be an author. She still wants to be an author. She wants to write about science and make it interesting to, to the world. And then she, so she continues that work. And again, she's, her father dies, but her mother's there. She's got her, she's got her niece. 
She's got her niece's kids. Later she has her niece's kids' kids. So she's, she's, she's piecing it together, working click, click, click on the high heels in the, in, the, you know, in the marble floors of Washington, going home, putting dinner on the table, helping her sister and her nieces, and then, and then at 11 o'clock at night starting to write. It's an extraordinary story of caretaking, of commitment, of narcissistic ambition. She still wants to be a best-selling author. And of this, the kind of grace and, 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 and delicacy of this person. Because lesson number one from Rachel Carson, there are a number of them. Lesson number one, here she is, this is these, are all, these, these, these pictures are, are very Rachel, right? She's out in the, in the, in, in the nature, in nature and then she's back in the lab, right? Let's come, let's come back to that. So lesson number one from Rachel. She's a shy, quiet introvert. She's going to write a book that's going to be the most important book, arguably one of the most important books published in the 20th century, that's going to do magnificent things. And she's as powerful as most presidents, and she's an introvert. She's not aggressive. She doesn't have great public speaking abilities. She doesn't possess a huge slug of celebrity or charisma. All these silly little bling things that we think must be in our leaders. Right? I mean, we've been a little bit seduced, folks. We think leaders are people who are on red carpets, or people who get rich quick, or people who have a lot of charisma and, and aggression. Some of those things may be important. Certainly not getting rich quick and so a red carpet has nothing to do with character and competence. Leadership is all about character and competence. And we've got to get a lot more discerning and a lot more demanding of the people we're entrusting the governance of our nation, our nation and our kids' future to. A lot more demanding. Right? We've got to get off our smartphones and start asking, what did, what did that candidate do in adversity? How do I know that candidate puts the public interest first? We've got to start asking different questions. But she's an introvert. That's the point. Lesson number one is leaders come in all shapes and sizes. It ain't about a bunch of innate you know, in, downloads that you've got at birth. I'll say something more about that at the very end. So, She's working in the Fish and Wildlife Service. In 1951, she publishes The Sea Around Us. It's a smash bestseller. And she can quit her job. She's achieved her like, lifelong goal of being a best-selling author. And she spends the early 50s casting about, kind of wandering in the wilderness. And one of the interesting, second interesting lesson from Carson, I tell this to my young people, my students all the time, is that she always understood, women understand this better than men, I think, but we need to hear it again. We need to codify it here at this moment in history when we're all so in such a hurry. She understood the value of gathering seasons. Seasons when not a lot is moving on your kind of bucket list or not a lot of stuff that you hope to accomplish in the external world is going anywhere. And yet it doesn't mean all kinds of important stuff. So I tell my students, and Carson got this, appreciated this. You aren't gathering information, knowledge, honing intuition, gather, to toning your muscles of moral courage. You're gathering into yourself, about yourself, while you're looking at the larger stage and waiting for a moment to use what you've gathered. So for Carson, that moment comes in late, the late 1950s, 1956, when people that she know in her diaspora of connections start writing her about chemicals like DDT which many of you will remember had been used in large measure during the Second World War, and then DuPont, and well, Monsanto, and Dow, and Velsicol, and a whole bunch of big companies, and the US Department of Agriculture are using in huge numbers in households and spreading, spraying over fields. I was in Champaign-Urbana at Stadium Terrace near the University of Illinois, uh, we, they, we had DDT trucks spraying stuff all over the, all over the streets in the, 19th, in, in the early 1960s. So, she gets wind of this, and she starts getting disturbing reports about birds falling out of the sky, out of the trees, right? Cows dropping dead in the fields, kids getting sick, and she she vows to write a book and unpack the consequences of widespread, still largely untested DNA. And so the story of the late 1950s and early 1960s is her story, doing her homework slowly, methodically carefully to try and piece together, not a truth, the truth, about DDT and heptachlor and some other synthetic organic pesticides. Um, 
And she does that. She gets going. She knows she's onto something. She also knows it's dangerous because all kinds of vested interests don't want to hear that these pesticides may not be all they say they are. And in 1960, she is diagnosed. She's only half, she's less than halfway through the book, and she knows it's the work of her life. She's diagnosed with aggressive metastasizing breast cancer. And, the, and she's not sure she has a long time to live. So there's no chemotherapy. If she had chemotherapy, she might have lived a great long life. But she knows she's in now in a race against the clock to finish the book. And so the bulk of the chapter is about how she writes Silent Spring against great obstacles, physical and practical, as she's dealing with the, the, the clock ticking for herself. And again, you want to talk about grabbing your muscles of moral courage and grit. And she's working alone. Her mother's died. She's adopted her grandnephew at 50, a five-year-old boy, because her, her niece is dead and her niece's daughter's dead. And she's trying to finish this book. And there's one moment in the story, an astounding moment in the story, when she can't see. She has iritis. She's developed terrible complications from radiation. She has no hair. And, she's got, and she has a bad case of phlebitis, so she can't walk, and she's in a wheelchair. And her editor is reading her the pages, and she's editing the manuscript as she, she, by, by orally. And there's all these moments when it's just so damn hard. She writes these letters like, if I were superstitious, I'd believe some dark force doesn't want me to publish this book. But in 1962, two years after she said she'd have the book done, she's finished. She's very sick. She's finished the book. It's serialized in the New Yorker, and it immediately sets off a firestorm of controversy and criticism and, 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 and huge citizen awareness. There's a, there's a, there, the, the, the attacks against her are extraordinary. There's a USDA official that says, what does this woman care about future generations or what we owe to the earth? She's a spinster. Or Time Magazine, this is a, this is a hysterical treatise by a cat-hugging woman who doesn't know what she's talking about. Or Monsanto and Dow threatening to sue the New Yorker. And the New Yorker saying, go ahead and sue. No lawsuit was ever brought, has ever been brought against Silent Spring. Because when you take the time to uncover and piece together the truth, it is unassailable in civil litigation. The book is published. It becomes a bestseller. It's on the bestseller list for, at the number one spot for longer than any book has ever been on the bestseller list. I don't know how many of you noticed that read the New Yorker regularly that this summer the online New Yorker serialized in recognition of the 55th anniversary of the publication of the book serialized Silent Spring. A summer, by the way, when antediluvian and biblical flooding and hurricanes buffeted our country and when forest fires destroyed hundreds of thousands of acres lest you think there's any relevance to thinking about environmental sustainability and the fragile, right, retaliatory, strong web, diaspora, web of life that supports us all, as she writes. Two other things to say about her for our moment. Her call in this book is not only a scientific exposition, it's not only a careful, gracefully written, if you've read it or haven't read it, Pick it up and read it again. It's easy to read. It's beautifully written. All structured around Frost's po the, the parable or the, the structure of a road not taken. And to, but it's, a, it, 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 it's all these things. It's an exposition. It's an examination. It's, it's, a, it's a laying out. But at its heart, it's a, it's a call to citizen awareness and responsibility. And she says at the very beginning, listen to these words. They're so relevant today. She says, have we fallen into a mesmerized state that lets us accept what is dangerous or detrimental to ourselves and our communities as though we have lost the will to demand what is good? Have we fallen into a mesmerized state that, al that allows us to accept what we know is dangerous or destructive to ourselves and our communities because we have lost the will to demand what is good. Or later, a few months later, when Eric Severide interviews her, after the book is published, right, goes to the top of the charts, come back to one, in one minute to her, the consequences of this, she's interviewed on a show which is a precursor of 60 Minutes. You can Google it tonight when you get home if you want to see her. Eric Severide interviews her on a show called CBS Reports. It's right there on Google. 
And he interviews, it's a split, the, the interview is like 40 minutes long. It's split between interspersed with interviews from the guy from the chemical company who looks like something out of a horror movie. And then Rachel standing there in her, her, part, in her home in Chevy Chase with a wig, right? She tell, by the way, she can tell no one about her cancer ever because she can't have people thinking that she's on a vendetta journey writing the book. So no one knows except her literary agent and a few friends, a good family, a couple of family members. Anyway, she's sitting there very composed and she says, we are called at this moment not to master nature, but to master ourselves. That's the same damn call for us in lots of ways today. Last quote from Rachel, because she's so quotable. That the founding fathers did not include in the Bill of Rights the right to not be poisoned in our, in our air or our water without our consent is only because they did not have the foresight, as perspicacious as they were, to anticipate that we would need that protection. Kennedy, John Kennedy, gets wind of King of Carson's book and sets, and he and Stuart Udall, the Secretary of the Interior, and some other policymakers, including Justice Douglas of the Supreme Court, who was a great naturalist, and Abraham Ribicoff from Connecticut, set in motion a whole series of legislative hearings that culminate, that will culminate in a bunch of things that form the bedrock. This is she in her home that night of CBS reports. That will form, there she is, she, she, was got, she was pretty sick by the time she did the CBS reports, and she makes a series of public appearances in the last year and a half of her life, including this one before, Senate, before the Senate, Senate subcommittee on, on pesticides. But, the, but the, what, what happened with the book was it, laid, it set in motion a whole series of policy-making events that are the direct runway into the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Endangered Species Act, the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency, Earth Day, and a host of other foundation stones to the modern environmental movement. Without Carson, we just don't have it. There's a wonderful afterword by E.O. Wilson and, and uh, Al Gore in my 50th anniversary edition, paperback of Silent Spring. Each of them say, right, I owe more to her in what I've learned and what I've become than I owe to anybody else. So the importance of her work right now could not, could not be higher, could not be greater. She's an astounding, this is an astounding story. And I want to make her a symbol of girl power for young girls all over the world. Okay. So let me, let me close with a few lessons. We've talked about a bunch of them. Most important one that I didn't spell out at the very beginning is the, it's the muscle fiber. Maybe it's the fascia of the book. And that is that leaders are not born, they're made. And they're made from three ingredients. And these, these ingredients come from a guy named, a gentleman who I know, named A.G. Laffley, who was C, a CEO of Procter & Gamble and an alumnus of the school and a big Lincoln scholar. And, these are the, and he said this to me in a film I made many, many years ago about what we can learn as leaders from Lincoln. He said, nature and nurture are the first ingredient. Right? You're born with your endowments, your strengths, your weaknesses, your intelligence quotient, et cetera. And then you accumulate as you walk your path a series of experiences that are your mileage. So nature and experience and nature, nature and nurture are the first ingredient. Second ingredient, a moment arises that the individual understands, demands their leadership, that the individual realizes, demands their leadership. But the third ingredient, equally important, you gotta have the sugar, the butter, and the chocolate chips to make the toll house. Third ingredient, the individual has to decide for him or herself to get in the game. This story, each of these stories, is a story of how each of these people in those ingredients made ordinary people who made themselves capable of doing extraordinary things. So leaders are made, not born. I've talked about great leadership proceeding first from within, not from without. Effective leadership always proceeds from an individual's embrace of a mighty, decent, worthy cause. You can read a lot more about that in the book and how sustaining that embrace becomes in moments of doubt. Calamity, disappointment, and failure turn out to be great doors into new insights and new ways of thinking about oneself as well as new ways of being in the world. We talked a little bit about the, the transition from I to thou, the second lesson. We talked a little bit about detachment. There's a lot more in the book. We didn't talk at all about the importance of stillness, time alone, reflection. I worry a lot about that today. I worry a lot about how scheduled and racing and fractured and multitasking we are. 
We talked about pace, and we talked about showing up. We talked a little bit about strong leaderships, about committing to a worthy mission and then getting very adaptable in the way, the means you use to achieve it. We talked a lot about the second one, that they come, leaders come in lots of ways, shapes and sizes. We didn't talk at all about the, th the third point. There's a whole page or two in the conclusion about writing. And I'm not talking about emojis and texts. I'm not talking about LOL, exclamation point. Each of these people, only one of them was a writer. Each of these people, Lincoln became one, but he wasn't a writer. Each of these people used writing as a tool. Diaries, notes to self, all in longhand, all churning and thinking and parsing out their thoughts as a way of understanding right, how to think and feel about something before they acted. So perhaps, just perhaps, tweets and emojis are not enough because writing teaches us to think. Uh, courageous leaders, we talked about the big picture. We talked about the last one. Questions, observations, benedictions, Woo! comments.